Welcome to the first of our Islands Matter uh, webinar series for 2024. And um, this uh, um, it's, uh, gives me great pleasure to start off the, uh, the series with a, a, a very interesting um, uh, discussion um, that um, connects poetry, art and um, energy transition in uh, the North Sea. Um, so it takes a lot of fascinating boxes that we like to explore uh, in this series. Um, unusual and fascinating research that's being undertaken, uh, undertaken uh, in the Scottish Islands by people living in the Scottish Islands and by outside of Scotland uh, as well. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Camille Manfredi, who's the Professor of Scottish Studies at the University of Brest in Brittany. Um, and uh, she's the author of Nature and Space in Contemporary Scottish Writing and Art. So looking forward to her um, perspective uh, on uh, the Scottish situation. And um, I'm hoping that we'll also get uh, Monica uh, Suba, who's the Associate Professor at the University of Gdansk, um, who's the author of two monographs, Contemporary Scottish Poetry and the Natural World, um, and uh, Landscape Poetics, Scottish Textual Practice. So uh, I will try and get in contact uh, with Monica, but um, we will get started. And um, welcome, Camille. It's really nice to have you with us today. Oops, you're, I've just unmute you. You're on mute. There we go. There Sorry. We. Yeah, thank you very much. Monica is trying to join in the webinar just now. So hopefully she'll be here in a minute. Um, and I would like to thank you, Paul and Andrew, very much for your very kind invitation. Monica, I'm speaking on her behalf here, but we're both absolutely delighted to be here today, however, virtually. So I'm, I'm going to share my screen um, now. Yeah, it should be working here. There we go. Yeah, we can yeah. see your screen. Uh, Monica and I are co-conveners of the ASSET project, ASSET for Aesthetic and Social Constructions of Energy Transition, then, which are very much going to be the focus of our talk today. And as part of the ASSET project, we approach a selected body of works and practices within the frame of today's preoccupation with environmental issues and renewable energy. But they're also considered as partaking in the general debate over the enduring opposition between the productivity of land and sea on the one hand and the romantic construction of the landscape on the other. In Scotland, this opposition, of course, you will know this, has fueled many bitter debates um, over the years over energy production and now energy transition from the early 40s and the uh, bitter hydro debates to the more recent and equally conflictual discussion around the Viking wind farm project in uh, Shetland. I could find many similar examples here in Brittany or off the coast of Brittany. So as far as I'm concerned, and this is going to uh, differ slightly from the abstract we sent you, I will be talking from the dark side of the moon today and will give you a little perspective as regards the inscription of the oil industry in the literature of the Northern Isles. And I will be talking a little bit about photography as well. And then Monica, when she can join, and if she can join, will talk more specifically about Alec Finlay, Laura Watts, and that is their people's phototextual poetic primer, Eben and Flowen. So, um, going on to my next slide. Um, perhaps the most um, accomplished work of petrol fiction by a Shetlandic author was Alan Jameson's novel, Thin Wealth. It was published in 1986 and inspired from Jameson's work experience at the Salambo terminal at the height of the boom years. The novel chronicles the development of the terminal and follows a small group of islanders as they are introduced to, I quote, the excitement of advanced technology, the illusion of progress, the lure of affluence, all great eroders of community values, creators of apathy. Whereas in Greenville, the destruction of the community was but a phase in the history of the islands, Thin Wealth presents us with a somewhat different and darker picture. In the novel, the eco-dystopian streak is obvious, with references to the end of nature, post-natural chaos, and environmental toxification. 
Incomers are likened to invaders coming from across the ocean, busily building new worlds for themselves in an uncanny reenactment of the Viking raids at the end of the Pictish era, with hints of a modern war of the worlds when Jameson introduces elements of fantasy and science fiction into a narrative otherwise rather realistic. The novel blurs the line between man, a beast, and machine, and thus gives birth to a post-human bestiary that peoples the land with industrial monsters, every bit as horrifying as Wells's tripods. The monsters are standing guard over an oil terminal that becomes, I quote, a complete embryo alive and breathing. The figure of alien organisms determined to supplant animal and human life is particularly potent at the end of the novel, when Lowry mistakes an oil slick, Lowry, the main protagonist, mistakes an oil slick for a whale. The episode functions as an epilogue and is no doubt inspired from the Esso Branicia oil spill that struck Shetland in 1978, the year or two of the infamous Amuku Cadiz disaster. The ecological threat um, became very real on the 5th of January 1993, when Liberian flagged tanker Brea ran aground near Quendale and spilled her cargo of 85,000 tons of crude oil off the western coast of mainland Shetland. That same year, journalist and wildlife guide Jonathan Wills published Innocent Passage, The Wreck of the Tanker Brea, which is a popular science book that is permeated with a generalized sense of vulnerability, anger, and alarm that makes it a valuable testimony to the great emotional disturbance that the islanders then underwent. In 1993, memories of the Exxon Valdez disaster were still fresh, and it soon became known that the Brea had twice as much oil aboard as the amount officially spilled by the Exxon Valdez four years before. The oil was immediately vaporized over the land by hurricane force winds, and contrary to the more scenic oil spills of Amoku Cadiz and Deepwater, oil remained essentially invisible during the Brea disaster, much to the displeasure of the crowd of photographers who had made it to Shetland only to spend hours looking for oil-soaked birds and occasionally staging them if necessary. The fact that about 120 tons of dispersant were sprayed onto the oil did little to reassure the locals. Eventually, it was not just the sea that was poisoned, but also the air, the water supplies, the grass on which sheep and cattle grazed, the fish farms, and a, a very recurrent uh, image in Innocent Passage, the playgrounds too. Among the many dramatic and deliberately aesthetic photographs of the wreck, Many show the tanker's half-submerged hull, yet you see that on the cover of the book, battered to death by the waves and wind. And what we're looking at is clearly a form of catastrophic or toxic sublime, highlighting a not mixture of repulsion for the then ongoing disaster and fascination for the terrible, monstrous beauty of the wreck. Innocent Passage is a charge against the oil industry, and yet the book does not seek to evade the metaphysical, even literary dimension of the catastrophe. The wreck is likened to the awakening of Walter Scott's witch Norna from the pirate. The rhetoric is often apocalyptic. The wreck reactivates the fear of the atomic bomb, and it is part of the same ironic, Calvinistic form of retributive justice that Jameson had hinted at in thin wealth, an oil spill now and again was the price Shetland had to pay for enjoying all that oil wealth. And this was also the interpretation that was spread by the officials who chose to call the wreck an act of God, a convenient legal term for events for which no one is to be held accountable. It is not difficult to see that the consequences of the Brea disaster were as much environmental as they were emotional. One can remark on the consistency with which the authors, whether in creative nonfiction or in poetry, made use of the et, ar et in Arcadia ego theme. Another example is Alan Jameson's uh, prose poem Brea Rack, that appears on your screen here, and which falls into two parts, one titled F4 and the other one Efta. 
The dual structure of the poem dwells on the pairing of nature and death as natural peace gives way to catastrophic destruction. The rural idyll uh, is torn apart by some agent of change, uh, there again related to the resurgence of evil in the midst of the pastoral garden. The author deploys both pastoral imagery and apocalyptic rhetoric, and the wreck of the tanker Brea becomes a synecdoche for a more general environmental apocalypse, the symptom of what eco-critic Greg Garrick, Garrett sorry, calls the toxic taint of humanity, and that caused, in Jameson's poem, the banishment from the perfection of Eden. Of course, there are some distant echoes of Edwin Muir here. Both Wilson's and Jameson's texts were written on the spur of the moment and at the height of the environmental, also understandably, personal crisis. But there was indeed an after. Later poems and novels tend instead to celebrate the resurgence or resilience of the wild, resilience of the wild, and the redeeming power of the elemental forces. The gale force winds that dispersed the oil onto the land thus contributed to the idea of some divine intervention, a form of epiphany that would have cleared the oil away and sent the brea as nothing but a warning. Whether a miracle or a close shave, the providential dispersion of the oil gave rise to differing metaphysical interpretations. Take, for instance, in his novel, The Further North You Go, Tom Norton, who likens the spill to the original sin, and the wind to God's wrath and eventual mercy. However, the Shetlandic version of Deus Ex Machina is seldom Christian. More common is the mention of Mother Nature and Gaia, as in Christine de Luca's bilingual poem, Voices of Quendol Bay. Christine de Luca lends her voice to the sea, quite literally so, as the poem also appeared in audio form. The human is but the recipient of the moaning of those creatures who were the first and perhaps only victims of the black tide, puffins, ewes, and otters. Each spill brings its shocking images of human destructive carelessness, of dying seabirds and mammals caught in the oil slick. But uh, De Luca's approach is original in the sense that it remains ecocentric and firmly non-dogmatic. In, Lucas de, in De Luca's cosmogony, it is the sea that brings about redemption in the natural world. The last uh, verses here, I shall comfort you with whitest surf. The poem relies rather heavily on pathetic fallacy, but it also emphasizes the possibility of re-enchantment through the mastery of elemental forces, among them the vernacular, that is the untamed language of nature itself. Poems of ancient Atlantic, such as Christine's and Christy Williamson's The Wreck, have something else in common. They seek to distinguish between what is experienced by the locals, be they human, animal, or elemental, and what is likely to be denied by the distant others, politicians, legal advisors, and the like. The point will then be to mark the distance between the immediacy of experience and what they say. Writing about environmental disaster is then writing against denial and against cold pragmatic analysis. It is about finding words and images that will stand up to the original and official classification, to the terms that they will use to downplay the extent of the disaster. The jury, in the case of the Brea, were offered three choices of verdict, act of God, misadventure, or negligence. But Shetland literature tells a different story. Man creates technological monsters, fails at reading the omens, and is consequently faced with death on a massive scale until resolution by divine intervention. That's classic hubris, nemesis, catharsis. So from an aesthetic point of view, at least the, the wreck of MV Brea was reconstructed as a tragedy. This tragedy lends to a metaphysical, naturalistic, and or technological interpretation, mankind and nature versus the technological other. These texts aim to call the locals' attention to the need to defend their environment, but also to defend their community, and perhaps most importantly, their voice. 
but against whom or against what. These works reactivate ancient fears of an all-devouring neo-colonial power. They also reactivate mistrust towards the impersonal forces of the market economy. Metaphors of class warfare borrowed from eco-dystopian and invasion literature abound through the figure of the post-human machine as portent from God and images of islanders, poisoned children, poisoned lambs as victims amid the carelessness of the more powerful. Unlike uh, disaster strikes, Unlike disaster strikes, the aesthetics of oil are characterized by the invisibility of their material object. Oil terminals and offshore facilities are out of reach and out of sight, and oil can only be represented or suggested as circulating matter, kept safe from prying eyes within the tubes, pipelines, or tankers that convey it from A to B and B to C, provided everything goes according to plan. The petrocultural landscape would then tend to be subjected to representations that beautify or vilify not the actual product, but the tools of production and convert these into ready-mades, the delivery systems and networks of oil production and distribution. The treatment of the network by visual artists will often dwell on the tension between the appreciation of the aesthetic beauty of the container and the knowledge that what it contains is toxicity itself, if not an ecological catastrophe that is just waiting to happen. And this is why I wanted to turn to Shetland again and to Roseanne Watt's 2014 film poem, Salem, which explores the part that the oil terminal has played in the constitution of Watt's own situational memory. But explore is a poor choice of words because the film poem is characterized by its lack of focus its extensive use of flair, foreground and background blur, as if to suggest the resistance of the site to thorough examination. It is often filmed off-center in long shots and appears as a post-natural or a petro-imperialist fortress looming in the distance. It stores an ecological gas flare acting as a blazon amid the uh, mid an island landscape which is otherwise undisturbed, as, as testified by the acrosmatic soundtrack of the opening shot, Birdsong. The visual treatment of the terminal, tucked in a far corner of what's north, could then belong to what I offer to term petroleum picturesque, as opposed to the petroleum sublime of one Edward Bertinsky. The film poem acts as a bridge between nature, culture, and technology, between image, sound, and word, also between post-human and affective landscapes and petroscapes, between pastoralism and petro-melancholia. Salem opens with a quote from George Mackay Brown's Scapa Flow, and soon the veins of oil will ebb and flow, which implies that the landscape we are being shown is a post-Black Star one, and yet it is anything but post-apocalyptic. The oil as blood topos runs smoothly out of Brown's text into what's spoken words, with the extended biological metaphor contending that oil is precisely what keeps the islands alive, which is or was true, at least as regards the economy of the Northern Isles. The film ends with a close up shot on a dead girl. The image belongs to the visual register of the ecological Jeremiah and contrasts dramatically with the bird song of the opening shot. Interestingly enough, this is when what reverts to the vernacular merkening, from merken to grow dark or murky. If Salma is indeed to be watched and listened to as an investigation into the effective connections between the oil industry and the other than human world, it also performs the re-territorialization of memory and language within the slick materiality of petroculture, especially since what borrows, ironically and anti-aesthetically, from the major oil company's advertisement campaigns down to the soundtrack of her film poem. When Rose and Watt released a salon, the oil boom was ancient history. All is quiet on the Northern Front. That same year, 
Peter Ian Campbell started documenting the decommissioning of offshore oil rigs, once magic lanterns or starlings on fire in the far distance. The rigs are now fully in the here and now, abandoned, dismantled, de-aestheticized post-industrial ruins. This will be the subject of another talk. The time then has come for Scotland and the wider world to wean itself off oil, commit to transition away from oil and gas, and invest in clean renewables, particularly in wind and wave power, with Scotland and the Northern Isles proving to be world leaders in marine energy. The question now is, how can literature and the arts contribute to the energy transition? The answer, says Bruno Latour, lies in their ability to translate the global into the local, perhaps to reappraise the Scottish landscape, to connect technological futures with prehistorical pasts, and the natural world with Scotland's technologically advanced modernity. To initiate post-petrocultural representational practices and a new sustainable, ethical, aesthetic land use paradigm. To design the proto-aesthetics of renewable energy with a view to accelerating the process of acceptance of its infrastructures as spaces for reflection and creation. I think there's a lot to do in terms of social acceptability of these infrastructures. And finally, to invent a prospective sustainable nature culture that would successfully harness wind, marine, visual, and linguistic power into energy for all. And this is when I hand it over to you, Monica. Thank you very much. Indeed, Camille. Uh, Monica hasn't been able to get in yet. We've been still trying to uh, get her. So I don't know whether it's the, the Polish system or, or not. Um, but so far, we have, have failed uh, to do that. Um, so um, we're still trying. But in the meantime, um, I'm sure we have we have a number of, of writers, poets uh, in the um, uh, amongst the attendees. And I'm hoping that they have some questions uh, to ask you about your um, about your research so far and about the uh, the poetry that you've you've chosen to uh, to use to um, explore this this question um, and just to get started so people can think about one um i wonder if you have any idea idea of, it's impossible to say but i'm going to say anyway uh, what sort of literature might be um created uh in the uh, well since viking um the viking wind farm has gone up because uh, from my perspective and i think a lot of people living in shetland the impact of sustainable uh, a power generation is far greater uh, than oil and gas because um, as you suggested you know the oil is under the ground or it's in tunnels or it's in tubes and it's uh, occasionally it appears and causes a disaster but it's not with us all the time unless you go up to Solemn Vaux and you see the, the the flames but the the impact the visual emotional cultural just impact of uh, Viking is huge um, it's changed Shetland far more, I would say, uh, than than oil and gas. And yet, it's supposed to be the sort of the saviour, uh, if you like. It's it's, um, it's it's painted as this this wonderful thing, um, and yet Shetlanders are having to cope with this in a way that other uh, communities, um, well, in the Scottish context, don't have to because. The other wind farms of this scale are sort of hidden away, but we, we sort of have them every time we drive between the north and south, the south and the north. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think Monica would be great at answering this question because the answer is possibly this: uh, the Eben and Fluen. And I think that's the the whole point of what Alec Finlay, Laura Watts, and Alistair Peebles were trying to do there. That is to to make these infrastructures um, aesthetically acceptable too. You know? Because of course there's, the visual impact is, is massive. I mean, I was in Shetland not too long ago and I spent quite some time there too. So uh, 
I, I know what they look like. It's everywhere in Brittany too. And the thing is, we we fail at um, accepting these infrastructures, these shapes, these aesthetic objects into our landscapes. And uh, I think this is where uh, the arts and literature have, have a part to play in trying to um, incorporate these infrastructures into our imagination, into the way we picture uh, the landscape too. Um, and, and I think that's exactly what they were trying to do, uh, uh, Finley, Woods and Peebles in um, Eben and Fluen, that is try and create um, images, I mean, I'll show it here, um, images of um, infrastructures that uh, blend in the, um, the environment. And um, it's really a shame that Monica couldn't join, but uh, uh, also in creating um, these um, visual representations of these um, infrastructures that are related to renewable energy and that can somehow um, be taken over and incorporated by language and imagination too. And um, it's going to take it's going to take a while. <laughs> I mean, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, there's a very nice poem by uh, Robert Crawford too. Um, wind farming. You familiar with this poem, Andrew? Wind farming by um, Robert Crawford. It appeared in the tip of my tongue. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think yeah, that's um, a good example too. He's He's trying in this poem to uh, um, to have uh, wind farms enter the um, social cultural construction of the past too. Uh, he compares them to um, propeller driven crosses of the risen Christ, great ghosts of standing stones. And I think that's one of the powers of literature too, is trying to make these acceptable by uh, having them um, chime with some of our visual interpretations of our past, of our landscape, of our land too. I'm not sure I answered your question there again. Yeah, I think yeah, Monica yes, would did. be much greater at it. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's, um, that's great. And yes, to make them, um, well, they're definitely a feature of the landscape. Uh, there is something, uh, when they're not so overwhelming, there is something rather beautiful about wind generators in that they, they're moving a moving part of the, the landscape that wasn't there before. It's just the, uh, the scale is so huge, it's difficult to... <laughs> maybe the next generation who's grown up with them and sees them as part of the landscape, maybe it'll be easier for them. Um, so we have... A, a... Oh, sorry. We, we do have a few offshore wind farms in, in Brittany too, and it's, it's fairly new, but in order to increase the social acceptability of these infrastructures, you, you can't see them from uh, land, actually, here comes Monica. Um, they have started taking tourists to, the, to yeah. the actual turbines, you know, and I don't know if this is something that you do in Shetland now, but uh, it might be interesting to take people on tours to and take them well, around. I think that's one, that will happen. Um, also, there's lots of roads that have been made between the uh, the wind generators that haven't existed before, which will open up um, a lot of the, the the hilly land in the centre. And I'm sure there will be people walking those routes and cycling them, and they will be kind of absorbed into the the cultural awareness of people. Um, and it's fantastic uh, to see uh, Monica, but just before we, we, we bring Monica in, um, who must have been really stressed out trying to, to get to get to so we'll let her relax a little bit. Um, there's, um, there, there's a couple of uh, comments in the chat, uh, one from Shuin who says, do you think even past literature that cast the oil industry as monstrous ended up normalizing it? So there's a... Yeah, that's a good question. I think that was a distinction I was trying to make to between the literature that was written on the spur of the moment and the literature that came maybe a few years later and that might have normalized uh, the, the oil spill and the catastrophe and the disaster by turning it into something else, by somehow romanticizing it, by turning it into this Jeremiah that I was referring to earlier on, that is to, by having it fit in, um, you know, a genre 
um, a box and a frame that would eventually indeed normalize it. It's just another catastrophe, another sign that we humans don't deserve nature uh, and that because of us, you know, things will never be the same again. Yeah. But yeah, I agree with you, but I think that's why that's why it's it's really interesting and fascinating and moving to uh, to to read and approach the the words that were written on the spur of the moment. I had the same feeling with the COVID uh, pandemics. You know, look at the things that are produced almost on day one, you know, and that was the case for um, well, uh, Breton poets writing about the Amuku Kadis, for instance, you know, the immediate reaction doesn't normalize anything at all, quite the opposite. Yes, indeed. Well, we'll, we'll stop with that thought uh, just now. There are some other questions and, and um, impressions, but we'll come back to those uh, because hopefully now uh, Monica is... Uh, <sighs> is relaxed. So, uh, Monica, it's great to have you. And um, I, I, if you've got a, something you'd like to share, there's a share button down at the bottom of the screen. So um, if you just click on that, that should give you the option for um, choosing your material. Okay, thank you so much, Andrew. And apologies uh, to everyone for just uh, barging in. Uh And then disappearing again. <laughs> oh dear. Um, right. Okay. Uh, I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, hopefully, Monica will come back in again in a minute. Um, but just before we uh, we'll take the opportunity, um, it, Laurie had her hand up at some point. Ah, oh, no. Here we go. Well, Monica's back. Okay. Well, right, Monica, you're back with us. So. It's you're... just not a very uh, <laughs> kind uh, day for me i suppose i'm trying to share um okay, my so... uh keynote uh mm -hmm. um presentation yeah. uh, so let me know if you can see that there it is okay um um i'm so sorry camille i didn't hear your presentation i really wanted to uh to uh to to learn what you have to say about the Shetland Islands because now I'm I'm going to talk about the Orkney Islands and uh, this is this is initially what we uh, uh, decided to talk about this one text uh, Eben and Flowen that was published in 2000 in 2015 now so I'm I'm also looking at it I haven't been looking at it for a while now I'm starting to um, feel maybe um you know i uh, i'm curious uh what you uh, uh will think about the um the text because it was published almost 10 years ago now so how those approaches to uh the the uh, renewable energies uh in in the orkney islands maybe have changed uh how the attitudes have changed so um i just have a script i'm going to read it very quickly uh not to take up too much time um and my idea behind the, this talk is is to look at the cultural, the relationship between cultural production and renewable sources of energy as presented in this uh, um, little book uh, that was published, uh, that was uh, written by Alec Finley, Laura Watts, and with photographs of, uh, by Alistair Peebles. Um, and... Uh, um, I think the focus, main focus of uh, of of this book is um, language, experiment, uh, but also tradition and community. So I find it really, really quite rich uh, uh, text. Um, the publication offers an appreciation of uh, regional culture, uh, which despite this post-imperial notion of peripherality sometimes attached to it uh, characterized by is characterized by high complexity and as well as innovative artistic social and technological solutions so i would like to draw on energy humanities and um, uh, discuss the ways in which Evan and Flowen offers a vision into integrating uh, renewables into sustainable futures of maritime communities. Um, 
they um maybe just uh uh very briefly about the uh about orkney as as the site of of renewable um energy uh, production uh the harbor prides itself on innovation in a renewable energy seizing the opportunity which lies in the potential of tidal uh current energy to increase the the um the technologies the modern technologies um it's a wave uh still a wave energy test site and and i think it's it's a, it's a positive sign that it it keeps working it didn't maybe it's it wasn't as ephemeral as um as some reviewers of the book uh suggested uh it is still uh working and developing uh, there so uh it's still a small scale tech industry uh it's a nursery tidal test site and uh, the Orkney Islands uh, make good use of the natural resources, such as wind and tide. Uh, there are 18 meter waves, uh, uh, 18 meter high uh, waves and tides rolling as fast as four meter, meters per second. Uh, the energy islands, this, this term uh, is employed by Orkney Renewable Energy Forum and, and it's, it will return in, in my talk. Um, so energy, not only tidal, but also biomass, uh, wind, solar, wind, uh, and uh, yeah, those uh, those sources. Um, currently, um, uh, the Orkney Islands are at the forefront of decarbonisation and transition uh, to zero carbon fuels, uh, such as hydrogen, for example. But uh, it's not a new thing because Orkney um, may be considered uh, energy, uh, renewable energy pioneers. Uh, it has been a site for, for such energies for decades. Um, a laboratory, as Laura Watts uh, writes in, in her book, Energy at the End of the World, an Orkney Island saga, a very important publication. Um, in, okay, I've got some, some historic uh, uh, material. This is, as you can see, uh, uh, mid 50s, uh, Edward William Golding. Uh, the generation of electricity by uh, wind power. He was a uh, leader um, of a coordinated international development program for wind generated energy after the war. And um, Costa Head was the UK's first experimental wind turbine uh, built uh, and installed uh, as the first grid connected uh, device in 1951. Um, it did not endure uh, the Orkney wind, uh, so 200 kilometers uh, per hour gusts, and collapsed after a short uh, period of functioning, but it definitely paved the way for the uh, Burger Hill uh, wind farm established in 1983. Um, Co-founded, uh, so now coming back to, uh, this is still uh, a, a photograph from, from Golding's book. And now coming back to Eban and Floan, uh, it, it was um, a part of a project, uh, Energy Futures, um, Alien Energy uh, at the um, University of Copenhagen. Uh, and I, the, I want to argue that this is, uh, this is a, a publication that is inscribed in Scotland's ambition to establish itself as a global leader uh, uh, in the generation of renewable energy. This is from the uh, What the Scott Wind uh, website. Uh, one of many, um, one of Alec Finley's many collaborations, Eben and Flo and seeks new forms of energopoetics, to uh, use Stacey Balkan's term, while exploring vocabulary to create a potential representation of energy futures. The collection is situated in and around Orkney, uh, but it it casts a wider net, uh, one can say, reaching across the sea uh, towards um, uh, the Nordic countries, um, uh, re-establishing, uh, reinforcing all the uh, connections, all the relations. Um, so there are there are references also to the, those traditional. Um, uh, 
uh, traditional uh, ways of, of maybe uh, living in, in the Orkney, such as um, Yudal law uh, and kelp industry uh, through those. This is the, the latter is achieved through uh, Rebecca Mars wonderful photographs, which feature on the uh, on the uh, uh, inner cover on the uh, flaps. Um, so the C uh, factions uh, here um, as this connecting uh, channel, and uh, yeah, it brings the promise of uh, of uh, energy renewable uh, futures. Um, what uh, Alec Finley writes in the uh, in the foreword, um, this uh, mm, technology uh, myth and uh, writing that there is one uh, myth uh, poem mythical in a way creating a, a modern myth um, poem uh, written by Laura Watts so there are poems uh, uh, linguistic poems experimental poems there is a myth but also there are, there are these references to to modern technology and all this combines to cite Alec Finley old law and new law remembering the future uh which i find uh really quite uh quite a, a fascinating way of putting it connecting the past and the future uh which the whole publication uh, uh is 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 definitely doing uh, the the idea based on forging new language and establishing new myths, which imagines a possible future for for us, um, so for the Orkney Islands and beyond, um, forms part of other Orkney and energy related publications. Uh, in with this was um, part of Lara Watts' pro pro project. Uh, so there is there is the aforementioned energy at the uh, end of the world published in 2018 um, at the MIT. Then also Laura Watts and Alistair Peebles' uh, collaboration, Energy Futures, a, a handbook, which came actually uh, slightly late, uh, earlier. Um, this was a collaboration across arts and social sciences, edited by both Watson Peebles, focusing on the potential of the Orcadian landscape and, as the title suggests, uh, emphasizing the plurality of, uh, of its possible futures. Um, in an attempt to imagine a post petroleum uh, future, Eben and Flowen considers energo power, as Dominic Boyer um, uh, says energo power understood as uh, bridling fuel and electricity related to this um, concept of biopower um, co coined by Michel Foucault, uh, which uh, forms part of, to quote Boyer, new anthropocentric and ecocentric biopolitical imaginaries responding to climate change, uh, end of quote. Recognizing global sociopolitical consequences uh, of reliance on petroleum, uh, uh, Finley, Watts, and people situate hope in poesis uh, or poetic creation uh, for the passing of uh, fossil fuel and ushering in of a new energy paradigm. The twilight of an era of the old regime uh, requires the reimagining of novel uh, forms of energetic power. And here I, I would like to uh, refer to Timothy Mitchell's Carbon Democracy, the Future of Politics post petroleum uh, who speculates that the future uh, of politics post petroleum means, quote, the building of solutions to future energy needs, also the building of new forms of collective life. And this collectivity is something uh, that uh, Eben and Flowen definitely um, foregrounds. By imagining a world in which the paradigm of energo power can be shifted away from the extractive mode, Eben and Flowen expresses a sense of urgency accompanying energy production in the face of ever-increasing demand for energy. 
Uh, Finley's uh, interest in the potential of renewables is revealed already in his project Skying. Uh, this was a blog uh, um, uh, subtitled Art, Landscape and Renewable Energy, published in the years 2011-2012, in which he focuses on wind turbines. Um, mm, he, for example, writes about uh, Bilia Crew, uh, the construction of Oyster 2, um, and this, um, he uses this, this poetic um, expression, uh, oyster to the prongs of the rig are more lobster than oyster, um, to show you uh, <laughs> what uh, oyster to uh, looks like. Yeah, uh, these are some of the uh, photographs uh, from Ebanon Floen. Um, so Finley says, this is the future. Uh, wind turbines, still uh, talking in, the, in, in this blog, Skying. Um, for Finley, uh, wind turbines may be perceived as quote unquote symbolic monumental sculptures, uh, which perform a significant function in producing energy while being a conspicuous reminder that quote, we could all take the responsibility for that uh, scarce uh, resource. Unquote. Uh, in his uh, correspondence with John Burnside, a staunch critic of wind farms, uh, Finley expresses a belief in, quote, a social community or national ownership. Um, end of quote. Um, so this national ownership of renewable energy power sources, suggestive of a cooperative, which is tied with placemaking. So a, uh, a just energy future for Finley can be imagined by foregrounding the importance of locality and community ownership, combining the role of literature and art with environmental justice, which involves social and economic issues of coastal regions. The communitarian aspect, which lies at the heart of Eben and Floen as well, creates a strong sense of a shared dimension of renewable energy, opposing it to the exploitative uh, capitalist practices. So let us maybe look um, at uh, Eben and Floen, um, because I've been talking around it, not really um, about it yet, uh, it seems. So this is the, the bottom uh, of the back cover. Um, and uh, you see this, this um, mm, the sign, um, the words, a primer for marine renewable energy. Um, the word primer is interesting here. Um, referring to um, a small book, uh, which it is indeed, uh, with basic facts aimed at beginners. Um, and so it announces the program didactic function of the work, a basic text for teaching the subject of tidal energy. Uh, mm, and it also like a primer in, in painting, it becomes the first layer, uh, a preparatory coat, uh, we could say. Combining word and image, Eben and Flowen explores the functions of language such as play and imaginative forging uh, cultural energy. Words printed over the photographs of uh, the devices enhance the crossover aspect of the work and nudges the reader towards considering the aesthetics of energy. In the post-natural landscape, uh, the photographs of the tide and energy devices at EMEC at the European uh, Marine Energy Centre test site in Orkney offer an attempt to familiarise the eye uh, with the devices disrupting the shore, the line of the horizon and the seascape. So, um, as you can see, those those words uh, um, printed are on, on the photographs. The aestheticization of technology arising from the age of the machine introduces a modern sensibility, but one that is uh, still ecologically concerned. As Sarah Danius notes in the census of modernism, technology perception and, and modernism, quote, technology helps change not only the world, but also the perception of that world. This is partly why the image of the machine enters modernism together with problems of intelligibility, end of quote. Conversely, we can say, uh, inscribed in new and forthcoming infrastructural imaginaries, the project uh, such as Eben and Flowen, with its environmental dimension lies um, the belief that art um, changes the perception of technology. Uh, so 
by combining science, uh, poetry, uh, storytelling, uh, Eben and Flowen traces the etymology of words across various languages and employs the generative potential of uh, poetry. As the authors write in the for, uh, foreword, quote, languages also have their tides. The energy of speech, as its sound rises and lulls, is always Eben and Flowen, Eben and Flowing, end of quote. The um, connection between tide and time uh, underlined by Finley reminds the reader of the returns and rhythms inscribed in the tidal movement, which becomes a um, metaphor for um, cultural uh, continuities. As I have, um, so this is, um, uh, this is this poem um, that shows uh, the tidal movement of language. Okay, um, so what languages, words, and phrases might endure, uh, wonder uh, the authors. Um, the circular motion of tidal waters is evoked in, in streams, uh, the circular poem. Uh, so streams is repeated and recurs not only uh, in English. Um, streams, but also flow, streams flow to and fro as sea stream, but streams repeats in uh, languages and dialects uh, such as Swedish, Dutch, Icelandic, Danish, German, uh, uh, historical languages uh, such as Orkney, Norn, Old English, Old Norse, Old Saxon, Old Frisian, Old uh, uh, High German, and Proto-Indo-European. So the echoes reverberating in these words demonstrate the overlapping, intertwined nature of the neighboring languages through their geographical proximity, as well as across temporal distance. Both through its form and content, the poem reminds the reader the manner in which the languages are interlinked, sharing linguistic roots, and the sea that interconnectedness uh, so that interconnectedness in the collective spirit of maritime cultures along the European shores. The playful use of language is coining, in coining the names of the devices uh, demonstrates the ways in which the cultural linguistic creative impulse nourishes uh, technological innovation. As the names of the devices demonstrate, the language of EMEC uh, is technical but also playful, often offering punning acronyms such as the catchy names explored by uh, by the authors. Uh, so um, here there are there are more uh, linguistical riddles, uh, one word poems uh, in Eben and Flowan. One word poems uh, here uh together with um a, a small glossary uh at the bottom of the page through the un unconventional employment of orthography uh, finley creates meanings that expand the boundaries of language um ushering in uh, new uses linguistic experiments and sound symbolism uh take cue from uh, lewis carroll's alice Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which is also mentioned here uh, in the book, and also echo futurist experiments in trans reason or beyond sense uh, uh, by Vladimir Klebnikov, a modernist futurist uh, poet, uh, whom um, Finley also uh, um, mentions. So here are some more uh, examples from, from the book. Uh, so the Duchess in Alice in Wonderland says, take care of the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think, yeah, these are, these are some more examples, Evan and Flowen. Other sources uh, in the book include Origins and Elements by Margaret Tate, uh, Catherine Mary Briggs' book on fairies and uh, in tradition and literature. There is a long reading list at the end of the book, um, which contains references to 
um, further reading, to websites, uh, to an, uh, an, an e-learning tool on aquatic renewable energy technologies, um, a link to FisherNet, so Fishing Cultural Heritage Network, a book on the generation of electricity by wind power, that's Golding, a link to the Norn Language Forum, uh, collected books of George Mackay Brown, um, and more. Um, a brief look at these sources reveals numerous interconnections between the language, land, and sea. Um, what else? Um, this approach to language and communication uh, recognizes meaning making as ecological dia uh, dialogism. I, I want to just shout out to uh, to Rebecca Ford. Uh, there is this uh, great essay, Orkney Eco uh, Ecologies, in which uh, Rebecca Ford uh, uses Tim Ingold's concept of, of a meshwork, and, and she talks about dialogism, uh, so Bachtin's uh, concept. And mentions Eben and Florin, uh, apart from um, The Outrun by Amy Liprop and other texts. To end, uh, I want to say that Eben and Florin is an example of how, in an attempt to meet uh, decarbonization targets, imagining carbon free future aids the transition away from fossil fuels. So, imagining, imagination, and, and art in language. Transcending uh, this fossil fuel era, uh, Ebanon Flowen is inscribed in the global debate on energy transition, reflecting um, this ambition uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, for Scotland to be at the forefront of the ongoing change. Uh, by combining the poetic function of language with the functional use of the energy devices, the book points to the two and highlights the zones of contact between art and technology local and global, human and ocean. In search for possible versions of sustainable futures, Finley, Watts and Peebles delineate the forms of socio-technical life which people perhaps, perhaps, and that, that's the question, would like to inhabit. There's always the renewing and renewable power of language which remains in its collaborative cross-medial cross manner of this uh, speculative work. Imagination, uh, yeah, so this is um, just to show you the booklet. Uh, imagination can always envisage more than technological praxis, uh, which seems always contingent, uh, always pragmatic. Examining such, such such alternatives to petroculture by imagining a new ebon and flow and opens new horizons for thinking about energy cultures. That's it. I'm really sorry it was so uh, chaotic, but I really I spent 45 minutes trying to like 100 times to uh, to join and I don't know what happened. It, not at all, Monica. It wasn't chaotic at all. I mean, the our, on our side trying to sort of get things sorted out. Um, there was a bit of uh, rushing about, well, lots of emails and everything going, but um, it, it was fine. That's uh, you came in just at the right time. Uh, we had the opportunity to ask Camille a, a few questions, and then then you miraculously appeared. So uh, it worked uh, extremely well. And um, thank you very much for uh, exploring this. Uh, connection between poetry and technology and you're certainly getting some responses there uh, in the in the chat and um, there's a couple of questions about loss so uh, Yulia saying um, both in poetry and literature and in the translation of natural energy into electricity what about loss does something get lost on the way and if if so where does this difference go and then Laurie is saying she also wonders about loss and she finds she's finding it challenging to find art that valorizes technology. Rather, it tends to lament the losses to landscape and to our relationship with an attachment to the land. I suppose it's, it's still this old romantic way of looking at uh, human life and um, and literature and landscape. Um, so even as we know intellectually that we need to transition away from fossil fuels, it's difficult to find artists who are sort of making that case. So. Um, yeah, so uh, I wonder if, if, if yourself, Monica and Camille had any thoughts on that. Oh, thank you, uh, Andrew, and, and, uh, th thank you for the, um, uh, for those comments. Uh, I can see, um, I'm just looking at the, 
the chat. Um, uh, yes, the lo the loss of 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 landscape, Julia and uh, and uh, Laurie. Uh huh. Um, yeah, I I think um, what uh, I see I see I I find Evan and Flo in such an such an interesting uh, little book simply because it's it's um it maybe tries to take a different um a position um it doesn't uh it's not inscribed into in 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 this um uh, eco poetic uh lament uh of um You know this nostalgia uh, that is inevitable uh, uh, as we as we see what's as, as we are acutely aware of of what's happening and and how much is is, is simply irretrievably lost. Uh, I I think this is such a modernist text uh, in in this nineteen twenties uh, uh, sense of the of the world. Uh, how it tries to to be futurist, you know, and 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 it's seen in the in those uh, um, experiments with language, and in in that uh, attempt to um, well, uh, I like what uh, uh, what Laurie uh, writes uh, how it um, valorizes yes technology. So how it tries to maybe familiarize us and and maybe familiarize us not to not to um, put not to place technology as as this this um unacceptable in 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 uh, encroachment into the landscape i mean I, I struggle with it myself because i i, I can't really um maybe uh, take the same uh, position, but I appreciate uh, this effort on the part of the authors to uh, to attempt this, this, this utopian vision, you know, in a way um, it's realistic, uh, it's utopian, but at the same time it's realistic because this is what we will have to live with. I mean, we cannot go back to pristine landscapes as much as, as maybe some of us, I definitely, I would love to go back to those, but it, there's no going back. So what what can we do? Um, I don't know. I, I, as I said, it's it's such a such a st uh, strange, such an interesting um, uh, little book that I I keep I keep coming back to it, thinking about what it does um, and how much it differs from many. As you, Andrew, as you rightly said, how how it differs from from other texts. Thank you, and I see Julia is actually interested also in the. The loss of energy between transforming well energy is not, is not lost as it's transformed but uh useful energy is extracted from uh tide or wind some of the energy goes somewhere else so um i'm not entirely sure uh oh. what she's on on about there but it's a, it's an interesting thought there's a this other element of loss as well um mm. give me you had a hand up yeah, if I may, because I was interested in what you wrote in the chat, Yulia, and also what you wrote earlier on, Paul, about you know, what it meant exactly, remembering uh, the future. And I think they're all related, because actually, I, I, I like this book too, uh, Monica, and I like it because I find it moving, and it's somewhat a stubborn attempt, you know, to uh, aestheticize or to appreciate these machines aesthetically when we know that these were just prototypes. One of them was tested in Brest uh, not too long ago, and actually they don't work because there's too much energy lost in the process and in mm. the transport of that energy back to land. So yeah. they, don't, they don't quite work, you know, they're not efficient yeah. enough yet. They will be soon, but not yet. And I think that there's something in this book too about remembering the future but it's trying to project us into a very distant future where these, all of these machines, these infrastructures will have become assimilated into our cultures already, you know? And I think that that's what I find also moving about it. That it's trying not to, not to deal with the immediate future, but to, you know, to, to, 
to try and envision some very distant future where we won't have to worry about whether these machines work or not, you know. And uh, and that, yeah, I think I think that's moving. I think that's what I like about the book. And what I like about the book too is um, are the photographs by Alistair Peebles too that are trying to reconstruct a landscape that includes these machines and that hasn't changed. Um, there's, a, there's a very nice photo of Bill Crew here, the test site, but you get to see cows, you know, in the foreground and yeah, some rig in the distance. The landscape hasn't changed. Uh, never mind, never mind the rigs, they're here, but don't pay attention. And yeah, I find I find this particularly moving and particularly efficient in the book too. Mm. Mm. If I may, I um, because this and, and I saw that Paul, it was your uh, your um, question about remember yeah remembering the future. Uh, uh, interesting. Uh, um, I I was interested in what you said, Kemi. Uh, I I actually to me. Uh, it rings. Uh, it it makes me think about this this um, this concept of um, how to be uh, good ancestors uh, by Roman Knazitz. Uh So re we need to remember the future by what we do now, how we act, because what are our actions currently and and this is about extractivism this is about energy consumption in in the context of Evan and flow and i think um we need to remember that there will be future uh and that the that there will be uh you know we will be ancestors once and um that 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 that's how i i think about you know this old lore and new lore so whatever we do at present uh will have uh an effect uh in the in 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 the future that's a that's a great point um i, I saw somebody talking on telly and i can't remember who it was just a couple of days ago and he said um uh, i'm really worried about the the future for for my grandchildren because i love my grandchildren but um my great, 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 great grandchildren couldn't care less. So uh, we don't want to be like that. We want to think about the people into the, the distant uh, future uh, as well, leave them a legacy. Um, well, I think that uh, brings us to the end, uh, quarter past uh, one here in Shetland. And uh, I'd just like to, to thank uh, Camille and Monica for two very fascinating uh, talks, uh, thought provoking things to take away. Um, and new ways of approaching the changes that are um, taking place in the Scottish Islands uh, at the moment. Um, we're living through great change and it's only going to get more. Um, I think we, we have a, a little bit of armory uh, in the, the Northern Isles because we're used to big um, infrastructure and energy projects um, you know, with, with oil and gas and it's sort of built into the the DNA a little bit, so hopefully that will help us to cope with uh, the greater changes that uh, are coming in future. But yeah, thank you again for uh, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. And my love to Shetland. <laughs> See you soon, maybe there. It would be lovely to meet you. Yes, indeed. <laughs>